Dr. Shubir Gokran, Executive Director at the International Monetary Fund. Dr. Gokran, always a pleasure to have you here on NDTV Profit. I'm going to start with the IMF's latest World Economic Outlook, where it's retained its India growth forecast for 2016-17 at 7.5%, while lowering global growth forecasts to 3.2% in 2016, suggesting once again that India is one of the few bright spots in the world economy in relative terms. But in absolute terms, should India and could India do better? Well, I think we have to uh, look at growth as an outcome of both uh, domestic and uh, external forces. And when you look at the global environment uh, and the forecast that the VO, the World Economic Outlook, uh, has put out for the world economy and also many countries, uh, clearly the global economy is looking uh, somewhat sluggish. Uh, keep in mind that this forecast is slightly down from the previous round in January, uh, and this has been a trend for quite some time now, that each uh, forecast is, is being revised down. So this is not pointing to a very healthy or an optimistic outlook for the global economy. But in this context, I think it's quite reassuring that uh, the Indian outlook uh, remains uh, constant. And this suggests that to an extent, uh, domestic factors are helping at negative uh, global drivers. Uh, so this gives us some reassurance that uh, domestic policy initiatives are likely to, to have an impact, at least in the assessment of the, the IMF. And uh, in that way, India is uh, buffered uh, from what is clearly a very negative global outcome. Uh, but that helps us stay where we are. Uh, I think we need clearly to recognize that, that we need to do more of which is uh, the whole reform agenda, whether it is investment in infrastructure, whether it is uh, uh, the GST, uh, labor market reforms. All of these are the now the sea of reforms uh, because uh, the IMF uh, basically suggests that the space for monetary and fiscal policy globally uh, is limited and uh, now it's really up to each country to carry out uh, an agenda of reforms that will allow it in the long term to accelerate growth. It's not an easy uh, task, no question, uh, but it's really uh, what remains as the most uh, appropriate, and the most necessary policy option. And you know, I'm just going to take a moment to understand what you uh, figure are uh, uh, the biggest risk to the India forecast, one on the downside, one on the upside, what would you pick? Well, I think on the downside, uh, the, the real risk is, uh, you know, commodity prices, oil shooting up. We've, we've got a, a significant benefit, as we all know, from lower oil prices in particular, but lower commodity prices in general. Now, that doesn't look like a very high probability. In fact, looks like an extremely low probability outcome. So I think from a global perspective, the downside is uh, relatively limited for us. Uh, so we have to then focus on the domestic uh, agenda and you know, what are we doing to accelerate uh, growth domestically. And I think uh, the risk really is not moving uh, as quickly as we should on, uh, on infrastructure, on uh, fiscal reform and so on. On. So, but this is this is a well-known story. This is not something uh, that we're learning for the first time from the uh, IMF publication. But I think it reinforces, it emphasizes the point that given the global situation uh, and given that it is relatively uh, uncomfortable, if not openly hostile, uh, the onus uh, for accelerating growth uh, is becoming more and more. Uh, are lying more and more on domestic policy actions. And this is not just true for India. It certainly is true for India. But it is also being emphasized by the publication that it is increasingly true for other countries as well. So, yes, there is room for action on many safety nets and so on, coordination on, on regulation, coordination on, uh, on uh, financial stability. Uh, but at the same time, if we are looking at accelerating growth, uh, the responsibility is falling more and more on individual countries. Well, 
Dr. Gokran, what do you make of the positive confluence of data a few days ago? You know, the above normal a monsoon forecast from the Indian Met Department, IIP, the CPI data points. Is it too early to start celebrating the above average monsoon forecast for starters? <laughs> well, it looks like a lot of people have already started. After two years of, of uh, glum news, obviously, this comes as uh, literally a you know, refreshing shower. Uh, yes, uh, the, the early forecast, the advanced forecast is obviously subject to a whole variety of risks. But I think what's important in this uh, situation is the dominant reason for, uh, for uh, the improvement in outlook is the uh, abating of the, the El Nino. And I think given that, that there's, I think, a fairly strong correlation, it's not perfect, but there's a fairly strong correlation between the El Nino and uh, drought conditions. Uh, and the fact that it is abating would suggest everything else remaining the same, uh, that the monsoon outlook is brighter. From that perspective, I think uh, the forecast uh, provides some reassurance. Of course, we wait till uh, you know June to get a better uh, sense. But uh, what's also reassuring is that this time the official forecasts and the private forecasts are very much in sync with each other. Uh, so while, of course, we have to wait and see what happens, uh, the fact that uh, we are seeing generally evidence pointing towards a normal monsoon should give us uh, relief on two fronts. One is that the rural economy will improve from a relatively low base. So that means more rural spending, consumption, and so on. Uh, and very importantly, you know, the driver of food inflation in the last one year, last several months, uh, has been the price of pulses. You know, increasing by 30, between 30 and 40 percent uh, year on year for the last several months. Uh, if you have a good monsoon, then that pressure will will immediately uh, fade. And I think that's really good uh, from the viewpoint of the overall you know management of the growth inflation balance. You know, talking about inflation, uh, I was just reading the uh, wholesale price inflation numbers for the month of March. I'm going to stick with CPI, though, which has also been a focal point of discussion over the last few days. Uh, skeptics say that the long-term target of 4% could still be tricky to achieve. Assess inflation and that target. Uh, it's a, it's a to comment on uh, the specific numbers. I think what is important is that we have uh, a process, a framework in place, uh, which is intended to give comfort, which is intend intended to increase uh, the credibility of uh, the system's uh, you know, priority and intent uh, to keep inflation uh, under tight control whether it is 4% or 5% or 6%, and obviously the range that the framework is indicating is between 2 and 6%, with 4% being a mid point. Uh, I think what is important is that uh, commodity prices are clearly helping to, achieve, helping to achieve that target. And if you have a good monsoon, uh, then food inflation, which has been creating some uh, pressure in the last few months, uh, will also now move in the opposite direction. Uh, so at least for the time being, the inflation outlook looks uh, looks uh, relatively robust in the sense that the, the range will clearly be met. Uh, but there's always going to be volatility. There's always going to be ups and downs on specific food items. You can see, for example, you know, onions have been causing some distress over the last several years, but it's not very long lived. Uh, vegetables off and on uh, cause this pressure. So you're always going to see some uh, movement around the number. I think what's important uh, is for a framework such as this is that it is giving comfort and therefore the term, technical term that we use is anchoring expectations so that people don't have to, to uh, confuse what are temporary movements in, in inflation uh, with more permanent movements and then start to you know, change their behavior as a result of that. So the anchoring of expectations is very important and, you know, the targeting framework that we are putting in place is one way to contribute to that. Dr. Gokran, um, would be good to get your comments on the liquidity boosting measures that came through during the credit policy. It is an attempt to address uh, what had become uh, somewhat of a, uh, a constraint on effective transmission. Uh, and there are a number of things that the Reserve Bank is doing to try and facilitate more effective transmission. 
uh, we have seen a uh, transition to uh, the the cost of funds being uh, moving from uh, or the, the the whole uh, uh, the, the whole process of setting base rates uh, by banks moving from uh, the average cost of funds to the marginal cost of funds. So as uh, as policy rates drop, uh, marginal costs of funds are, are expected to drop, and so that should be passed on. Uh, tight liquidity tends to constrain banks from uh, from lowering their uh, uh, their lending rates. So moving to a neutral liquidity situation may help to facilitate. So I think. One has to look at this specific action, uh, not so much uh, as a one-off or a standalone act, uh, uh, policy move, but rather as a com as a s one of a set of moves um, uh, of actions that uh, is trying to or is is intending to improve transmission. Uh, so this is an ongoing process, I think. I mean, the, min the as soon as we recognize that transmission is a problem or weak transmission is a problem. Uh, we have to think of a variety of ways that will help to strengthen it. And I think what we've, what we've seen over the last few months is, a, is such a variety. There may be other things that uh, need to be done. Uh, for example, more structurally speaking, uh, the idea that we need to have a much more uh, effective, uh, fuller, richer, thicker uh, debt market, a government securities market, a corporate bond market, which will certainly help in transmission. Uh, but that's a that's a significant structural move. So it's not something that can you know, be achieved overnight. Uh, several things need to be put in place to achieve that. But all of these things help, and I think uh, that's the that's the larger context in which we need to view these actions. A comprehensive assessment of the liquidity boosting measures uh, by the Reserve Bank of India. What about the bad loans issue, sir, in the banking system, the numbing effect on credit, and subsequently on investment? Well, I think uh, we have to look back at uh, the, the Indra Dhanush uh, program as uh, being the sort of starting point of a significant uh, job to repair uh, bank balance sheets. It's an intense and not fixing it uh, as quickly as we can is going to risk both uh, the health of the banking sector itself and also its ability, most importantly, to, to provide credit, which is going to fuel the recovery. If you don't, if you have a recovery without credit, it's not going to survive, it's not going to sustain. Uh, so again, a number of steps are being taken, and uh, one of them uh, very significantly is the, the speed with which uh, the banks have been asked to, to clean up their balance sheets, to provide fully for all of their bad assets. Uh, this does two things. One is it, uh, it uh, creates conditions for them to start lending quicker than otherwise. And uh, very importantly, it puts a lot of pressure on them to act aggressively on recovery. Uh, the incentive to recover has to be very strong, and I think this pressure is going to add to that, which is a positive sign. Of course, some concerns have been expressed about the process being too quick, and that might hurt banks. But I think somewhere uh, a judgment has to be made about what is going to cost us more, uh, the risk of, uh, of banks being stretched on preparing their balance sheets or letting the problem fester uh, for, for so long that ultimately you know, a, a much larger bailout operation has to be put in place. So uh, may I come them to, to act, uh, move in the right direction is strong. Uh, but the other part of it is, uh, I think, the point that uh, Governor Rajan has made uh, uh, in this context, which is that you know, just because somebody is defaulted, uh, doesn't mean that uh, he or she is out to cheat the system. Of course, there I'm sure there are people who've done that, but uh, you know, there is a business cycle on. We we are not anywhere close to the trough or the crest of the business cycle. We're closer to the trough. There's a lot of excess capacity, and businesses are under stress. Uh, so we're going to see, uh, uh, you know, asset quality deteriorate in the situation. So it's important when we are looking at solutions to uh, distinguish between uh, what is being, you know, what are called willful defaulters or willful default and uh, genuine business distress. And I don't think you can really, uh, you know, use the same approach or the same treatment to deal with both problems. They both are problems, but uh, they need to be dealt with as uh, the resolution process, uh, the bill that is uh, uh, circulated to be to be discussed in Parliament when it reconvenes, 
is a very important contributor to that. And I do hope that uh, we get some speedy uh, movement on uh, the enactment of that bill, uh, which will also contribute to a much uh, cleaner and a much uh, quicker uh, you know, a solution to what is clearly a very, very pressing problem. Well, Dr. Gokran, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much for your time here on NDTV Profit. Really appreciate it.